Let me pray. Father, with a, a mix of emotions, we sit, stand here in this moment. The emotion of, of joy and elation and the emotion of, of contentedness and rest. Perhaps the, the emotion of uncertainty and confusion. But we are in a, in a bunch of different places right now in our hearts. And I want to say over, over all of it, thank you. Thank you for being a God who meets us each where we are, right here and right now, and is at work in each one of our hearts here and now. You are indeed the King on the throne reigning. We sing songs to you and we attempt to express exuberance. We, we sing more loudly with fuller throat and louder amped up music and it's nothing compared to the chorus of heaven. Not just in its volume, but the chorus of heaven with which we take part right now is filled with, with a depth, a sweetness, a, a glorious, contented rest and exuberant worship, perhaps even indeed a little bit of confusion, because we will never fully understand the infinite. We will never fully know what it was for you to take all of the wrath of God the Father onto you, Jesus. We will never fully understand that. We will never fully see the depth of your love for us that moved you to do it. We'll never understand all the power that overcame death and raised you. We will indeed wonder a little bit forever. And in heaven now, the saints that sing wonder even as they rejoice with the depth that is full and, and awe-inspired. Lord, would you meet us now, each one of us, in the place where we are, and teach, guide, build your church, use this text, shape our thinking for how we are to be now and how we, are, uh, how we will be in the future. Grow in us praise. Grow in us servant hearts. And Lord, I pray that if there are some here, surely there are some here who, who don't fully understand you, who don't know you, who are not in fact believers, would you move in ways that open their eyes and that save? Build your kingdom today, Lord. Have mercy on us. Lord, clear away all things that would be hindrances and barriers. Clear away sin in our hearts and minds. Clear away distraction. Help us to hear you. Would you speak? Speak through this passage and build your church. For the honor of Christ and for the good of us as people, we pray. Amen. We turn our attention this morning to the end of Luke chapter 1 to consider a Christmas text on this Easter morning. A Christmas text. I mean, if we've been preaching through Luke, many of these are, are, quote, Christmas texts. But of course, it didn't actually happen at Christmas. They just happened. So they're always appropriate throughout all of the year. They're appropriate here today on Easter also to help us think about what actually happened on Easter. We're working through the book of Luke, looking at the first chapter here, and we've seen two accounts of two messages from an angel about two births, one improbable and one impossible, but both of them related to each other. The impossible one was announced second. As the angel came to a young girl, Mary, to announce to her that she was, though she was unmarried and it was impossible for her to bear a child, she was going to nonetheless because nothing is impossible with God. She's going to have a baby. The long-awaited Messiah, the King of Israel, the Deliverer was finally coming, Jesus. And before him was coming another messenger, a, a prophet who would be named John. And that was the first birth announcement. We saw that at the very beginning of, of the gospel. The angel comes to an old man, a priest named Zechariah, while he's serving in the temple and says, Improbable as this is, your wife has passed childbearing years and has, ever been, has never been able to have children throughout her life, but she's going to have a baby too. 
And his job is going to be as a, as a forerunner, a, a prophet going before this coming king. He'll be born. Zechariah has a hard time believing that, and as a mild rebuke for his unbelief, he is made unable to speak throughout the time of his wife's pregnancy. But his son John was coming. And both those pregnancies happened, and the mothers met and rejoiced together over it. As we saw last week, in fact, Mary in particular sang a song of, of worship and, and praise and thanksgiving to God. She sang of what he was doing for her personally and for his people, people corporately, and she sang that while she was in Zechariah's home. And then she left, and it was time for Elizabeth to give birth. Which brings us to our passage for today. John is born. The people marvel. Zechariah's speech returns. And in his then, his prophetic song of praise, we'll find truth about what God has done and what God is doing and how that relates to Easter. So let me read all this passage. I'm going to begin in Luke, 50, Luke 1, verse 57, and read through the end of the chapter. It's a long passage. I'm going to read it. The introduction, and then I'll pass back through it to make a couple of the details clear before focusing on the prophecy itself to draw out two observations. Luke 1, beginning in verse 57. And now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, then they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God, and fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea, and all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Luke 1. The passage begins with Elizabeth finally giving birth, and the response of the community that's gathered around her strikes two notes that we've seen often and we'll see again. God shows mercy, a very common word in this chapter. God shows mercy and the people rejoice. Rejoicing in response to mercy. That's, that's their, their attitude there. And when they go to, to, to watch the circumcision and the naming, they expect him to be named after some name in his family. But Elizabeth breaks with custom and says he's going to be named John. And then verse 63, Zechariah confirms it, and they all wondered. Something unusual is going on here. The whole thing's unusual. The fact that she's pregnant in the first place is unusual. The fact that Zechariah was suddenly, he walked out of the temple unable to speak. He was suddenly struck mute. 
That's unusual. And, and in fact, while the emphasis is, is on his inability to speak, if you notice in there, it says that they signed to him in verse 62. And it's possible that the word about speaking is also a word about hearing. It's possible he could not hear also. That's what it seems to indicate. He was unable to communicate, to hear or to speak. That's unusual. And the fact that he's named John is unusual. And so God's drawing attention onto this boy, and people are wondering about it. They're pondering it. And then something really unusual happens. After his name is, is written down, then Zechariah's ability to communicate suddenly reappears, and he, and he speaks and he speaks prophecy and praise and blessing, and the people are no longer wondering. It says they are afraid. And word spread throughout all the surrounding countryside. And as they, as they thought about this and thought, something odd here. I don't know what. But everybody's attention is drawn. What kind of child is this? That's the question that, that is at the end there in 66. Who is this? For the hand of the Lord is on him, for sure. What's going on? And that's what brings us to the focus this morning. I'm going to be looking at 67 and following and draw two two points out of the prophecy that Zechariah speaks to answer the question, what kind of child is this? What's going on here with this child? He's going to speak first about the bigger picture and then he's going to come around to answer this question specifically, who is this child? I'm going to make two observations. Here's the first one. In mercy, God has given us salvation to himself for his service. In mercy, God has given us salvation to himself for his service. Verses 68 to 75 He begins to answer the question by talking about the big picture and we'll have to follow through a really long train of connected thought to get to the end. This passage has two halves to it. At the end of the first half is a point that we've got to follow this long train to get there. He begins by speaking in praise, worshiping God, speaking as something has already happened. God has done it because he knows that Mary's pregnant and everybody else doesn't. He knows that God has already acted, and so he blesses God. The Lord has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation. That's where Zechariah begins. He has visited. God has drawn near to redeem, to pay a price, to buy people out of, to buy out of bondage. Visited. Redeemed, raised up a horn, not like a trumpet, but a very common image from that day, like animal horns. The, the weapons that animals used to fight, a very common image for a mighty warrior, especially a mighty warrior king. He has raised up a mighty warrior in the house of David, the king. And we know he's talking about Jesus, the Messiah. This great king would be a king of salvation who would redeem his people, just like the prophets spoke about from long ago, verse 70. Which might then lead us to ask, following the chain through, what's that salvation going to be like? What's it going to look like? Well, he says, verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of those who hate us. He's raised up this this horn of salvation He's going to save us, save us from our enemies. But that's not the end goal either. There's the, God's not acting ultimately so those people just wouldn't have enemies. Keep moving on. Verse 72, he promised to deliver from enemies to show the mercy promised to our fathers. To remember his covenant. The Abrahamic covenant, the oath sworn to Abraham. God is not just acting in this moment to be kind to these parents or these families or this people right now, but what he's doing right now reaches way back in time to Abraham. God made a promise. He swore an oath. And he's keeping it. So what's that about? 
What is it? What's this, this covenant, this oath to Abraham? We can read about it back in Genesis, but we get Zechariah's summary of it, his spirit-inspired summary of it here. And if we read about the, the covenant with Abraham way back in the Old Testament, sometimes we get caught up in some of the details like we focus on. He promised him a people, and he promised him to protect him, and he promised him a place. True elements, but those are only elements. They aren't the, the final purpose why did God make a covenant with Abraham? It's summed up throughout, repeatedly throughout the Old Testament in this phrase, they will be my people and I will be their God. What God said he was going to do is I'm going to make a people, I'm going to bring them to myself and I will relate to them. I will be God to them. I will bless, I will rule over, I will shepherd and they will worship and walk with me. Together, I will be their God, they will be my people. That's throughout the Old Testament, and Zechariah sums it up here. What about that oath? Well, he's, he's going to act to free his people from slavery. He's going to bring them all together. Read at the very end of verse 73. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. That's the end. That's the purpose. All this is building. He has visited and redeemed, that is, raised up a, a king to save us from our enemies, to keep the oath that he promised, which was to bring a people to himself to serve him without fear. G. thanks. Is that how that strikes you? It, it might strike you, it might strike some of us as kind of like I gave a lot of build up to something there. At Christmas you got this great present delivered to you underneath the tree and it's got, it's, hu it's a huge box and it's really heavy and it's got a whole bunch of paper around it that's beautiful and you're a teenager and you're thinking, man, what kind of electronic device is this? This is going to be awesome. And you, you rip it open and what it is inside of there is a, a big rock to deceive with the weight and a certificate that entitles you to mow the lawn and do the laundry. <laughs> Gee, thanks. I get to be your servant. Just what I wanted. God has acted to, to visit, to redeem, to raise up a horn of salvation. He's moved to keep a promise that he made throughout all centuries and in mercy has freed us from our enemies to make us his slaves. Gee, just what I always wanted. It is what you always wanted. You need to reconsider what that means. So let's think. What is he saying there to grant us that we, being delivered, might serve him? What is he saying there? First, we need to understand that to be a servant of God is not set in opposition to being free. To be a servant of God is set in opposition to being a servant of some other master. Because we all serve something. We all serve someone. The Bible is really clear. There is no such thing as, as me, an autonomous person, my own boss. I am a servant to something, to someone else. Now you can look through, look through life and you can see I, I serve people, I serve my boss, I serve a spouse, I serve goals and agendas, yes. But the Bible means more than that. Behind that, before God steps in and claims us to be his slaves, the Bible is really clear. We are all slaves of sin, mastered by the prince of this world, Satan. That's a reality that needs to be set right on the table beside, in mercy, he made us his servants. 
Because what was there before that was we were servants of sin and servants of a master who hates us and comes and exists purely to kill, steal, and destroy. That is awful. What a mercy it would be to be set free from that and delivered out of that bondage as God typified it in the Old Testament, delivering them out of the bondage in Egypt to be his servants, to be set free from one claimed under another authority. To be set free from bondage to Satan and bondage to sin, bondage to things that kill and destroy is is a great blessing. And God has visited, acted to redeem mightily a horn of salvation. To do that, that we could be his servants. We could serve him. The first thing we need to consider is what the alternatives are to serving God. But secondly, we should consider that what Zechariah is talking about here, when he describes in this language what he's talking about, and this, we got to kind of lift up our eyes here and, and like look at something. What he's talking about is the kingdom of Messiah. In so many words, he's talking about what it will be like when Messiah when God's anointed one takes up the throne and extends his reign over all of the creation. To be a subject of a king who is the very definition of good. Who is the definition of love. Realize, all these words that we find precious in life, they do not exist out there, and then God took them on. God said, you know, love is a good idea. I think I will be loving. No. We have an idea of what love is, and we recognize it as good because God is love, and then extends it out. And we find it in the world in small portions here and there, warped a little bit there, but we know what it is. And in fullness, rightly, it is God. Mercy, a common word here. To be under the hand of a king who is mercy, who is grace, who is good, who is love, who is truth, who is right. That kind of a king's reign in which there is no longer any evil or any destruction, there is no longer any decay or any death, no evil whatsoever. What a kingdom where there is no misery, where there is no loss, that is the kingdom of Messiah where we can serve him without fear because there's nothing to fear. All of the enemies are gone. It is, to use the imagery of the Bible, like living in a city. In ancient cities, they had gates that they closed at night to keep out the enemies. The kingdom of Messiah is described as a city with gates that you just leave them open because there's nothing to worry about. Don't bother posting a watchman. No need. Ideas like soldiers and policemen. Jobs that don't exist anymore. Doctor, no need. That kind of a kingdom, to serve him without fear, before him, face to face in his presence. This is Zechariah the priest, who knows what it is to walk into the temple where you can't come, to walk into the holy place where now you guys can't come, To look at the temple curtain, behind it is God, and I can't go there. But no, no more. To be able to stand face to face before him. To commune with him face to face. Without fear, in holiness and righteousness. Set apart to him. Clean. Before him in service and in worship all my days. Not just like Zechariah experienced once in his life, all my days, forever. It is the kingdom come and it is the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven. And Zechariah sees it as already done because God has acted to send the king. 
It is a glorious thing. It is exactly what you have lived for and longed for all of your life and have not been able to have. But God has acted to make it possible and, in fact, to make it real. Not fully. It's not fully here. Obviously not fully here. He looks at it. He's he's got the eye of faith looking forward as if it's a done deal because God has moved the, the hands of time and has brought it in part, but not in fullness yet. But he has brought it in part. How do we know? Because of today. The enemy of death has been conquered. Not fully. As we heard read earlier, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the last enemy to be fully conquered is death. That, that doesn't come until the very end. But he conquered it in the beginning in a little way to show us this is what I'm about. This is the kind of power I have. This is what I'm doing. He came up out of the grave. The Gospels also recount how, in fact, other people came up out of the grave to show that the resurrection had begun. Not fully. He's still got another agenda for a few thousand years here. He's got things he's up to, but he gave us a marker. This is what's going to happen. All of the enemies, including the big enemy, death, are done. The kingdom is coming. It's not here fully, but it is coming. It has come in part. We need to consider now some of what that kingdom come looks like for us now. That's going to be the second point. How we get into it, it's the second point. But before we move to that, I want to pause here for just a second and hang on to the word serve. Because when I speak about, and sometimes even when I think about person, but when I speak about God delivering to us a kingdom that is full of such blessing, such good, sometimes a little slip can happen in our minds and it's easy to think that it's about me. Because in a real way, it is about you, gloriously so. Gloriously so, God has drawn near to bless you. But we need to consider the word serve. The fact that the Bible uses that word to describe what our face-to-face communion with him is like should clue us into something. We are servants of God. He has saved us to be servants of his. Servants are people who live for someone else's agenda. Who live for someone else's fame, for someone else's advance, who who live with someone else's resources, who, who look to someone else for guidance. That's what we are before God. Our posture before God in this glorious kingdom, and it is now in part, and it will be one day fully forever, our posture before God right now is one of open-handed, here's my life. It belongs to you, your servant. That may put a little check in us this morning, and if it does, I encourage you, write that down and ponder it. Gloriously he has saved you. Gloriously he's delivered you. To be a servant. He bought your life. He bought your life. Which means he, his will be done with me, with you. How long, in what ways, in what places? Well, We have difficulties in making decisions about these things, but we need to have behind that the the resolve that your will be done. I 
am owned. You are owned by someone. Which is still, it's still part of that really good news. Because of what kind of a master he is. But when he, when he writes things to us, when he says things to us, like we considered some months back in Philippians chapter 2, consider the needs of others more important than your own. Or when Paul talks about Timothy, who considers Christ above himself. That's the normal Christian life, not the exceptional one. He has saved us to be a people who serve him and through him then serve his cause in the world. He saved us to himself, to his service. And now we need to ask, well, what does that look like? How do we get into that? That takes us to the second point. Here's the second one. In mercy, God gives relationship with him in the forgiveness of sins. God gives us relationship with himself in the forgiveness of sins. The passage was supposed to be a prophecy answering the question, who is this child going to be? But John hasn't actually been in it yet. And now he comes up finally in verse 76. Zechariah looks at John and says, You child will be called prophet of the Most High. You'll be known as a prophet of God because you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Which is the same point that the angel made to Zechariah back in the temple. He's just repeating that. He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. How so? By informing people to give knowledge of salvation in the forgiveness of their sins. Second half of verse 77. There is a great barrier between us and what it is we really want. Standing in the kingdom as servants of God. And the great barrier, the greatest enemy is sin. And in mercy, God has announced to us off the lips of the the prophet John from the scripture, God has announced to us, I've come to save by dealing with your greatest enemy, the barrier, the, the, the one that holds you back from blessing. Sin. First and foremost, fundamentally, our problems the things we need God to deliver us from, the things we need a mighty warrior to save us from are not fundamentally physical or tangible. They are not temporal. They are not this world enemies. Indirectly, those things all are our enemies. They are all our threats to us. They all will be removed gloriously so in the new heaven and the new earth and the kingdom. But that is not fundamentally our greatest problem. Sin is the barrier that keeps us from receiving that. The problem is in here. In each one of us. The problem is not out there in them. It's it's in here in us. The problem of sin in my own heart is what keeps me away from the kingdom blessing that God would give. To stand before him, very end of 75, Before him all our days in holiness and righteousness is not possible for a sinful person like me and like you. Until God would act to deal with that. And in mercy, he gives knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Here's John preparing the way and saying, look what this would be like. 78 and 79. Look what this would be like. This, it's poetic language. You've you got you to let your mind kind of run with it to see what it would be like for God to forgive sins. Yours. 
What it is that you, forgiven, are delivered into, the, the state you're delivered from and, and delivered into, and then this is what you, what you walk in, what you know all of your days now before the fullness of the kingdom comes. Because of the tender mercy of our God, there's mercy again. God is, is so full of mercy to people. Whereby the sunrise shall visit us, sun shining to give light to those who sit in darkness. This is where we start, in darkness, in the shadow of death. Ruled by another master, by sin and by Satan, we sit in darkness in the shadow of death. It casts a, a pall over all of life. E even those of us who are young and strong and think we're never going to die, you, you know you're going to. And there's something out there that's kind of like a, a clock ticking constantly. Life's running out. Sands are passing through the hourglass. We, we, some of it, we kind of sense it just a little bit, some of us more closely so. There is a darkness that, that hangs over this world. It is, everything in it is categorized by decay and by decline, by failure. Physically and morally so. And for God to intervene, to draw near and to save in this way, to forgive sin is to shine a great light into that and to say, forgiven, cleansed, Indeed, death even destroyed. There's a, there's a tension there. There's a, wait a minute, Steve. You, you're just saying, I'm still going to die. I thought you said death was destroyed. It is. It isn't. It is. Oh, that you would, that I would, that we would. That we would put all of this passing life beneath something, beneath sin wiped away, God drawn near me, you, if you're a Christian, you are alive right now and will never die. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 says. Uh, odd, isn't it? That's what Je Jesus said when talking with Mary and Martha. He who lives will never die. Well, you sure he's going to die. No, he isn't. Yes, he is. No, he isn't. It's a, it's a bizarre mixing, isn't it? But that we would see it. There is a darkness, a shadow of death that hangs over us that has been removed, and we will never die. Jesus said there, and though we die, we will live. He's talking on both sides of his mouth, contradicting himself. You get it, don't you? Of course we're going to die, and of course we're never going to die. And you've got to put those things together and say, oh, then how can I walk through life without fear of that enemy? Is the tomb empty or not? The tomb was empty. The tomb, nobody thought that possible. Not even the disciples thought that possible. The tomb was empty. And do you know what emboldened them to preach that bizarre, impossible message to the very people who had killed him and held the sword in their hands still? You know what, what empowered them? They knew the tomb was empty and they said, kill me. I don't care. We are so far detached. I, I can't even imagine saying that. But they said that. They spoke that to the power that hung over their lives, this shadow, and said, it's not a shadow, not a, not a shadow. It isn't a shadow. It isn't. The tomb was empty. My tomb will be empty also. I can never die. I, I recognize that I'm speaking to some people 
present or, or who will listen to this later, who seemingly, by physical earthly standards, seemingly are closer to death than I am. And so it can sound like a lot of bravado. I recognize that. And all I can say in that situation is, I'm sorry, I don't attempt, I'm not attempting to be proud or chest-puffed stupid. I'm, I'm trying to be honest. If the tomb was empty, and it was, it's a historic fact, historical fact. If the tomb was empty, and Jesus lived again, and Jesus walked the earth for six weeks or so, and hundreds of people saw him alive, and he rose up in a cloud to heaven again and said, in the same way I'm coming back to get you, which he did, then the truth is, Christian, a light has shined into this darkness and there's a fact there that is stripped away that should in your heart and in your mind as you, as you weigh these two things out should strip away the terror of this death. Because it is not the final statement. You will die and yet you will live. We will die and yet we will live. He has given light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace with God, that we can stand before him without fear. Peace here on this earth between other people. God has given this in tender mercy to people like us who have no claim on him and have no right to this standing and have no right to this blessing. But in mercy, mercy, it's everywhere in this chapter. In mercy, God has drawn near and visited to save. And he does that in the forgiveness of their sins, which we have to ask a question. How does he forgive sins? Because it doesn't say here. It just says that he does. Does he just wipe them away, forget about it? No. Many of us are aware, I know, but perhaps some of us need to understand what John the Baptist said when grown up. You read about this later in the Gospels. When grown up and, and well into his ministry of preparing people for the Lord, he sees Jesus, grown up, approaching, and he says, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In that statement, we find the answer, how is it that he gives knowledge of forgiveness of sins by sending a lamb to be slain to atone, to pay for, take away sin? That's what Good Friday is about. On Good Friday, a couple days ago, we remember the cross where the lamb was slain. He's lifted up, killed not for his own transgressions, but for those of others. He's cursed. The Old Testament says that he was hung on a tree as cursed. Jesus was hung up and bore a curse, not for his own sin, but for ours. And was laid in a tomb where he stayed dead and buried until he was raised. The empty tomb says that God accepted that payment for sin. God approves of him and raised him from the dead. There is a way for sin to be forgiven. Placed onto the table in front of each of us is a payment that is sufficient. A payment that removes God's wrath, satisfies the wrath, in fact. Doesn't just eliminate it, doesn't just wipe it away, but satisfies it for those who trust him. Those who trust him. The question before us now, before all of us now, is 
that simple question of trust. Do you, will you trust him? All of this passage builds God has acted in time to visit, to redeem, to raise up a horn of salvation. And now we find how it is that he is a mighty savior, how it is that he defeats all of our enemies, how it is that he makes us so that we can be subjects of God before him, righteous and holy before him in his presence all of our days, how it is that he can forgive sin and shine light into darkness and cast it all away and give life and hope even now, how it is is he can go to the cross and die and be believed by you. But if you do not believe, none of it applies to you. Before you now is all of this passage built to this one question. Will you trust Christ? Or will you continue to trust yourself? That's the question. Realize that in trusting yourself, you are still mastered, you are still a servant and still a slave. But to a wicked master who wants to kill you and destroy you. So I ask you, I plead with you, trust Christ. Be saved. Know life. In mercy, God has offered to you a Savior if you will receive him. I realize that many of us here already have. As you consider all these things on Easter, what do you do with them? What you should do with them is rejoice. Really. Something, God did something. Really, he did. Zechariah is not just talking about ideas. Easter is, is what we celebrate on Easter. The resurrection is, is the, the backstop that holds us away from the idea of, well, that's one nice theory. No, it, it isn't one nice theory. When we bump into the empty tomb, we say, oh, it's true. Oh, Christian, it's true. It's true. Do you realize what he has done to remove off of you sin and to give you a standing that it's not yet realized, but it is a standing in the fullness of this kingdom. That is marvelous news. And there is, in that news, there is a promise of much more to come. The promise of death triumphed over. The promise of a a kingdom coming where the, the lion lies down with the lamb in the language of the Bible, where there is no more conflict, there is no more struggle, but there is peace, fullness and wholeness, peace. Of all days, now, we, have to, we have to remember the gospel and preach the gospel constantly to us, but of all days, this day, this day when we see in history a, a marker laid down about God's trustworthiness, this day should generate in you ah, rejoicing at God's mercy that he would draw near to you and actually do this. To save you now and to promise to you a glorious salvation that is to come. Our response to that should be a, a joyful, here's my life. You have won me to be your servant. Here's my life. God has visited to bring you to himself. 
Will you grasp hold of him today? Will you grasp hold of him in faithful joy? Will you grasp hold of him in in humble service? Will you grasp hold of him with a little bit of the of the appropriate humble bravado of, of 1 Corinthians 15, where, O oh, death, is your sting? The person who can say that over the grave, over their own grave, is a person who believes God has done this. The tomb is empty. He has. Go in peace, go in peace, go in peace. Go rejoicing and go as servants. Let me pray. Lord, there are so many so many words said here and I think I I want to pray over them that you would pluck out from them what is most important for each person and then that you would personally plant and water and tend tend the garden of each heart here and grow in it a great crop, a fruitful crop, a crop of life. Would you shine, shine into those of us who are believers and who are wavering and who are afraid? Would you, would you shine in a light of rest and triumph? Those of us who are believers in you but find ourselves sometimes given over to ourselves and our own agendas, would you remind us of your call to service and your good, great mastering of us, your wisdom and your power. And those here, Lord, who don't know, who don't know you, who are not believers, I pray, Lord, that you would shine in a conviction of sin, an awareness of their separation from the kingdom, separation from, from the joy of, of your presence. Bring conviction. And Lord, I pray, plant faith and water it and cause it to grow a fruitful crop of life. Save, please. Lord, as we move to sing and then celebrate with a couple of baptisms, would you continue to grow in us an understanding and a, and a joyful rest in what you have done and the fact that you are building your kingdom and that it is coming. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your, your grace. Thank you that you are a God of great mercy. We love you, Lord. Amen.